Hello everyone, it's Mr. Glode. Um, I'm going to be today uh, doing a little, hopefully not too long, of a video on um, biology. And <clears throat> I cannot promise that my uh, 21 month old son will not freak out during this. And I also promise that I will not show my face the entire time. But as you can see here, we're um, I'm in Google Classroom, and oh, he's got a stick. Come here. Say hi, everybody. Hi. What do you got behind your back? Oh my God. This is a stick he uses to find things. All right. Anyway. All right. Go play. Okay. Anyway, with that said, uh, let's get rocking and rolling. So Ms. Paulini gave you guys an assignment, and it one of the assignments that she has for this week is Chapter 4, Lessons 1, 2, and 3. Um, so I'm actually going to go through those. And uh, As I was saying before, you can see that I'm in Google Classroom here. Okay, I'm going to scroll down. Um, obviously, your Google Classroom does not look like all this because I'm a teacher and a lot of teachers have shared their classrooms with me. So, <laughs> here we go. Um, I'm actually going to do uh, focus on um, biology, biology period two, but it's the same for biology third period as well. Uh, so, let's get moving. And also, I believe, actually, that's, I think it's pretty much the same for biology period one, too. So, it's fun. All right. Biology period two. And as I said, I'm not going to keep my face up here the whole time. Just move it over here um, for just a second. So, what I'll be using, um, as you guys already know, I'm already using Google Classroom. Um, I'm in here I'm looking at Ms. Pauline's Google Classroom, and I noticed that she has a couple things. Um, she has a question up here. Okay. She has an assignment, which I'm going to do. And she also has this biome project, which, um, people need to focus on as well. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to go to the instructions. Okay. And I actually already clicked on this and I downloaded it. So it's a PDF. Um, and then I'm going to pull it up here. Okay. Now you guys don't have to have this. Actually, I'm going to click off my face now. Okay. Um, you guys obviously don't have to have this program. This program is called Kami. Okay. Uh, this is a, it's a free program to edit PDFs online. So you don't have to have this program. It's just something that I've used in the past. All right. So this PDF, this is what it looks like. Chapter four, lesson one, energy producers, energy producers and consumers. Okay. Um, it's got a little concept map uh, that shows the, the relationships between different organisms in the lesson. As you read, you complete the concept map using vocabulary terms and any other terms in the lesson. So I'm taking a look at this and, um, you know, it says, oh, oop, says autotroph. Oh, it wants me to write some text. So I'll put it in the text box. Oh, let me move the desk here. There we go. Okay, so we have some words up here, autotroph, and we need to know what these words are. Uh, uses, uses solar energy for the process of blank. Uses chemical energy for the process of blank. is ingested by a blank, also called a blank. Carcass consuming, meat eating, plant eating, plant and meat eating, detritus producing, detritus feeding. Okay, so there are no answers on this page, so I'm going to actually scroll down. And probably going to have some, some uh, initial answers on this page here. Um, so as, like, as we know, we have already looked at that page. We scroll down and it's, we can see that the first paragraph says all living things need energy, but no living thing can create energy. Organisms called autotrophs capture energy from non-living sources. Okay. Autotrophs store this energy in forms that make it available to other organisms, which is why they're also called primary producers. Okay, so autotrophs are also called primary producers. So I'm going to go up here and I'm actually going to type in here. I'm actually going to change my text box up a little bit. I'm going to type in purple. Um, and 
means I do in fact want it bold. Okay, so these are primary producers. Okay, boom. So autotrophs are also called primary producers. And leave that there. And then I'm going to go and continue reading. All right, let's see, primary producers, blah, blah, blah. All life depends on primary producers. I also have some other words over here. Photosynthesis process used by plants and other autotrophs to capture light energy and use it to power chemical reactions that convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and energy rich carbohydrates such as sugars and starches. So we know obviously that photosynthesis uses light energy to power chemical reactions that convert carbon dioxide. Already, we already know this stuff, okay? Um, that's over here. Let's see if I can oh, let's see if I can highlight this. I'm gonna highlight it in and eh, let's highlight it in green. Okay, so photosynthesis um, is very important here. We have this. Okay, we can highlight that in green. Yeah, it is a ball. You want the ball? Or, oh, you want me to play tennis? Okay, let's pause this video for now. Okay, and welcome back. All right. Welcome me back. Um, sorry, my son wanted to uh, play apparently tennis for a couple minutes, and then before we had to do that, we had to uh, pick up his crayons. So uh, take took a couple minutes, but that's okay. Um, so where were we? We're talking about primary producers, and now we're talking about um, photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. So we can see here. I just um, highlighted photosynthesis uses light energy to produce chemical reactions that convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and energy rich carbohydrates such as sugars um, and starches. So who uses this? Okay. It is the process that's used by plants and other autotrophs to capture light energy. Um, all right. So we go back up here and we can say up in our little um, box here, we're going to make another text box. We can say that the process is called, just bold it again, uses solar energy for the process of, right? Because that's primary reducers, use the, uses solar energy for the process of photosynthesis, okay? Now, you can probably already imagine what primary producers um, they use chemical energy for the process of, okay, if we go back down, and I probably think it's going to be chemosynthesis, right? Some bacteria can capture energy from inorganic, inorganic molecules such as hydrogen sulfide. These bacteria use a process called chemosynthesis. So I think it's fairly safe to say that chemosynthesis is the process in which uh, chemical energy is produced, used to produce carbohydrates, okay? So yes, primary producers use chemical energy for the process of chemosynthesis um, okay chemosynthesis oh it doesn't think it's a word is it a word yeah it's a word today so make sure i spelled it correctly chemo c h e m o s y n t h e s i s all right yep Chemosynthesis. Good. Now let's get rid of that. Okay. Now we need to figure out what autotrophs are ingested by. Okay. And they're also called consumers. I think we're going to get to that in the later part of the notes. So we'll come back to that. Um, let's see if I need to mark up any other stuff. I don't think so. Maybe, um, maybe this here, pro, uh, photosynthesis. Okay, uh, it's a used by autotrophs, blah, blah, blah. Already went over that. That's a good definition. And chemosynthesis is there too. So I'm going to kind of talk about that. Some bacteria, I like uh, bacteria, can capture energy from organic um, molecules. Okay, so the bacteria use 
process called chemosynthesis. Here we go. Visual reading tool. Write the names of the reactants and products of photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. Well, we've, we've actually already covered this in class this year, so we should pretty much know this, right? Um, we have photosynthesis here, and they produce with light energy something, and then chemical energy over here, right? So <clears throat> we kind of know that... Um, photosynthesis from past parts of our class this year. Um, that photosynthesis, let's see, if, I wonder if I can keep going here. Okay, so this photosynthesis uses um, carbon dioxide, CO, hmm, Can I make this, oh, here we go, two, look at that. That's very nice. Okay, we could do some subscript there. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. Okay. And what are they? What does carbon dioxide um, react with? Carbon dioxide reacts with obviously light energy. Oh, I think my son is going to try to want to play basketball. Yeah, I know it's a ball, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see the ball? Yeah. And knock down the tennis racket. All right, cool. Let me put, let me write what um, photosynthesis uses, okay? So it uses carbon dioxide and it also uses um, H2O, otherwise known as water, okay? So we have H, subscript two, O, and that's water. And it's also um, kind of a little bit of satire here. Uh, dihydrogen, dihydrogen monoxide. Okay. I think I'm going to play a little bit of basketball and I'll be back. So I'm going to pause this again. All right. And we're back. Hopefully. Hopefully, you guys. Hopefully, this is still working. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, let's make sure I'm just still recording. Okay, says I am. Well, that's the case. So we were talking about photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, you know, what happens with both of them. We know from prior lessons that carbon dioxide, H2O, and light um, through photosynthesis they help us create, make another box here, um, oxygen, and what else do they help us create? Oxygen and sugar, ah, like bold, sugar, <laughs> slash, starches, okay, also known as carbohydrates, okay, so that's what we know, um, <clears throat> photosynthesis, this is basically this whole thing here, this is photosynthesis over on this side, we're going to um, switch over to chemosynthesis, all right, and I actually had to look up chemosynthesis. Um, I know that Miss Paulini says, you know, Google can be not our friend, but I did have to look up chemosynthesis. So I'm actually going to do that with you guys uh, right now. So I'm just going to click here and do chemosynthesis. And I'm actually going to look at some images for it because I think those are more most helpful. So I'm gonna click on this here. Um, nope. Okay. When this comes up, we can see that chemosynthesis combines carbon dioxide, water, and hydrogen sulfide in this example, anyway. Okay, to form sugar and sulfur compounds. So, Miss Paulini, I'm, I apologize if if this is uh, you know wrong, but um, this is. A pretty good video, a pretty good picture here, in my opinion, of chemosynthesis. Okay. 
Hey, buddy. <laughs> so, what did we say? We said, okay, we said, bold again, bold, bold. Okay. CO2. CO2. And then H. Ah, I'm going to give up on the bold, man. Uh, two. Oh, not fail. H two O. Why does it keep doing that? H two O, and apparently hydrogen sulfide. Okay, I. Hydrogen sulfide. Okay. And what does that produce for these plants that don't have sunlight? It produces sugar. <coughs> right? Let's go back to our little thing. Yes, it produces sugar. Okay. It's basically what we all need. Everything needs to um, exist. So it produces sugar. Um, or, other, or other carbohydrates. Okay. And what else? It's two lines here. It's a sulfur compound. Sulfur compounds. Okay, here we go. All right. So, like I said, I did have to look that up. And sometimes Google can be your friend if you, you know, you go get to a kind of a good site here. This is actually, you can see this is from the New Zealand government uh, website, puts this up. Okay, and there's other, some other stuff going on here too. Um, but that's basically chemo synthesis there. Okay, let's go back here. Number one here at the bottom it says describe how photosynthesis and chemosynthesis differ in terms of how energy is converted okay well, obviously we know that energy in photosynthesis is converted by uh, light it's powered by light energy right and chemosynthesis is powered and runs on <clears throat> chemical energy. so We're going to say photosynthesis okay, is powered by sunlight while chemosynthesis runs on chemical energy. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> it's pretty easy to understand photosynthesis is powered by sunlight. Um, right. And chemosynthesis runs on chemical energy because there's no sunlight, basically. Number two, what important product do both photosynthesis and chemosynthesis have in common? Okay, so both photosynthesis and chemosynthesis produce food often as sugar or carbohydrates okay so basically both photosynthesis and chemosynthesis uh, produce food. Okay, that's how that's how plants and primary producers, um, autotrophs, you know, all these different words, um, produce food for what we'll talk about next. Okay, so here we go. Um, so I think this is good. We have some notes here. We started this up here. Let's keep going. Okay, we have those answers there. Uh, chemosynthetic bacteria thrive in places of total darkness and high temperature. I think that's kind of important here. I'm actually going to mark that up. I'm going to highlight that. 
uh, and high temperature there's caused in volcanic vents in the ocean floor also found in underground streams caves and mud of tidal flats okay I think that's important information out there to have okay so here we go build some vocabulary heterotroph a heterotroph is an organism that obtains food by consuming other living things also called a consumer now because I just read that and I also remember that uh, I had this up here. So this, an autotroph is ingested by a heterotroph, which is also called a consumer. That was kind of like the hint that um, gave me this, right? So heterotroph, heterotroph. Ah, oh, doesn't say it's a word either. Make sure I spelled it. H E T E R O T R O P H. Okay. Yes. Heterotroph. I did spell it correctly. So whatever. Okay. And we go back down to this. I think that this um, page is going to give us the rest of these answers here. Okay. How do consumers obtain energy and nutrients? Okay. Um, animals, fungi, and many bacteria cannot capture energy directly from sunlight or integrating sources. These organisms called heterotrophs. <laughs> Acquire energy from all other organisms usually by eating them. Heterotrophs are also called consumers. Consumers are organisms that rely on other organisms for nutrients, for energy and nutrients. Oh boy. Okay. Um, so, consumers are classified by the way they acquire energy and nutrients. So, we have carnivores eat other animals, herbivores eat plants, leaves. Okay, so we have some important words here. Oh, that's a fail. No, oh, that's a fail too. Mark this up. Uh, carnivores, right? Herbivores eat animal plants, leaves, roots, seeds, and fruits. Okay. Omnivores, such as humans, eat both plants and animals. Great. Uh, scavengers eat carcasses of dead animals. Okay. Decomposers feed by chemically breaking down organic matter. Gross. Um, this produces detritus. I think I'm spelling, saying that correctly. Detritus, small pieces of dead and decaying plant and animal remains. And then, uh, whoop, detritivores chew or grind detritus into small pieces, often digesting the, the decomposers that live on detritus. Okay? So we have the, these different. Uh, animals up here. Now I'm going to go back up to this because yes, and I was right. Um, there's some places here that we need to fill in with all these things that we just talked about. And this is actually going to finish this little um, uh, chart here. Okay. So heterotroph, heterotroph is a consumer and the, the, which ones are the meat eating ones? I think we're gonna start over this way. Okay, yeah, cause that's where it starts. Um, those are called carnivores, okay. The plant eating, plant eating ones are called herbivores, okay. The carcass consuming ones are called scavengers. Okay. The plant and meat eating ones are called omnivores. The detritus, detritus producing ones are called decomposers. And decomposers. And the detritus feeding ones are called detritivores. Obviously, because they detritivores. Okay, there we go. Now we have this whole chart filled out. I'm gonna have to figure out a way for you guys not to skip forward in the video. I'll figure it out. It's fine. All right, let's keep going. We did this page. Let's keep going down here. Oh, we have a question here using the word elements. <clears throat> um. Explain the difference between an autotroph and a heterotroph. I actually have a good uh, answer that I came up with, right? So 
the difference between oh my god I can't spell an autotroph and an heterotroph heterotroph is that autotrophs utilize um, the elements to self feed okay and obviously the elements are like sunlight and stuff like that okay sunlight and oxygen um, blah 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 Okay, so set the self feed carbon dioxide uh, while skip. Oh, let's, you know what? Let's make this smaller. Okay, and actually, then I'm going to um, skip down here while heterotrophs. Cannot use sunlight or other elements directly, and thus <laughs> utilize the auto truth for food. Okay. So if you think about it, right, um, autotrophs, both autotrophs and heterotrophs use the elements. But the difference is that autotrophs use the elements basically directly. Okay. While heterotrophs use the elements um, indirectly. I guess I could have just said that, but that's still my answer. Okay. So you have types of consumers beyond consumer categories here. We're going to continue moving on. Um, so uh, many organisms do not fit me into one category. For example, some carnivores such as hyenas will scavenge. Okay. So we're kind of getting into this idea that, um, you know, obviously not all animals are going to, especially humans, are going to do one type of eating. Right. Consumers in one category may differ from Another in subtle ways, herbivores may eat different parts of plants. Different plant parts contain different amounts of available food. Fruits and seeds are easy to digest and contain a lot of energy and nutrients. Leaves are plentiful but hard to digest and poor nutrients. No multicellular organism by itself can break down the cellulose molecules found in leaves. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, mark that up. Animals that eat leaves have cellulose digesting microorganisms in their guts. Good to know, too. Um, some grazing animals, such as cattle, spend a lot of time chewing their food to pulp. When they swallow the pulp, it goes into a part of the digestive tract that has microorganisms that can break down cellulose. So, yeah. Um, a lot of us more complex organisms have microorganisms that help us out. Okay. Many or grazers regurgitate the mixture of food and bacteria called cud. They chew the cud and swallow it again. With all this extra work, grazers extract only a small amount of energy from the plants they eat. Okay, grazers only extract a small amount of energy from plants they eat. Now, I don't think we're going to come back to that, but I think it's just an interesting thing. They must spend a lot of time eating. Fantastic. Here we go. Let's answer this question. Produce, create, or form something as part of a physical, chemical, or biological process and acquire to gain an object or asset from oneself. Now, here we go. Um, cool. Look at the photosynthesis diagram on the other page. Okay. If there were suddenly no sunlight reaching Earth, how would this affect the ability of plants to produce carbohydrates? Okay. So. Basically, we could answer that. We just kind of know 
um, from studying photosynthesis from before that if sunlight was, was not reaching Earth, photosynthesis okay, would not be able to occur. Right? And plants would not be able to produce oxygen and carbohydrates, right? Okay, so that's kind of important, right? So remember, um, if they can't, uh, let's move it a little bit, eh, that's good. Enough. If plants can't produce oxygen carbohydrates, then consumers or heterotrophs um, that are feeding on the autotrophs would not be able to uh, take those nutrients in, need nutrients in either. Okay. Here we go. Energy flow in ecosystems. Oh boy. Okay. Food chains. So we have to kind of go down as blah, blah, blah. And we have to, we have to write some details in here, um, about food chains, food webs, food webs and disturbance, ecological pyramids. Those are fun. Pyramids of energy, pyramids of biomass, pyramids of biomass numbers whatever um i think i did this correctly but i'm just gonna make sure hopefully you know i did um so here we go food chains and food webs food webs one or one organ eats another energy moves from the eaten to the eater oh let's not do that hold on mark it up correctly okay Okay, and in every ecosystem, primary producers and consumers are linked through feeding relationships. I like this, feeding relationships. I like to have feeding relationships with my food. Uh, these relationships vary, but energy in the ecosystem always flows in one direction. So that's important. From primary producers through various consumers. Okay, primary producers, once again, are autotrophs, right? Okay, so food chains, the simplest way to think of energy moving through an ecosystem is to imagine it flowing along a food chain. A food chain is a series of organisms in which energy is transferred from one organism to another. I have a problem with this, and I think we're going to answer that when we get down to food webs. Food chains vary in length, with some food chains having just one step from a primary producer. For example, in a food short food chain, a plant is eaten by an herbivore, which is eaten by a carnivore. Okay, that's a good example. Um, other chains can be much longer. Okay. For example, food chains, uh, in the ocean <clears throat> may have four or five steps from primary producers to the largest fish in the ocean. Primary producers are usually tiny floating algae called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are eaten by small animal plankton. The animal plankton are eaten by a series of larger consumers. So I'm actually going to go back up here and I'm going to fill this in. Because one of our first places to fill in is right here, this food chain thing. Okay, so food chain. Um, it says the food chain shows how energy transfers through uh, feeding relationships. Okay, and it's a series of organisms in which energy is transferred from one organism <clears throat> to another. Okay? That's one answer. Um, some are short. I'm just going to put that here too because I think that's something we can have. Some are short. Right, we had that example where we had a a, um, a plant, right? Then a herbivore, herbivore, then a carnivore. Okay, and some are longer. 
you guys can put that too if you want. All right, but it's up to you. Um, let's go read about some food webs now. Food webs. Many animals eat more than one kind of food. And that was the problem that I had up, um, up above, okay, because it's not realistic that they're, that, you know, food chains are going to be so easy, okay? It's not going to just go straight from phytoplankton to, uh, to a fish to my mouth, right? There's going to be other things that happen. So a lot of animals eat more than one kind of food, for example, humans, right? This means that the movement of energy and matter is not a simple chain, but can be much more complicated. A network of feeding interactions through which both energy and matter is move, move is called a food web. So a food web is a more of a network, okay? And that's why it's, it's good to think of it as a web. A food web is a more of a network. <clears throat> um, more complicated, you know, Food chains within food webs within a food chain. There are many food uh, food webs. There are many food chains connecting the primary producer to different consumers. Food web therefore is a network that includes all the food chains in an ecosystem. I like that. Food web is therefore a network that includes all the food chains in an ecosystem. Food webs can be very complicated because of the large number of producers and consumers found within some ecosystems. Pause this for just a second. Here we go. Just keep moving here. So we're talking about food chains within food webs and food webs and things like this. Obviously, you know, food webs are a little bit more accurate picture of what actually happens um, in the real world with food. Okay. Um, where else are we going? Okay. Decomposers and detrivores have vital roles in the movement of energy and matter through food webs. Many producers, I think this is important, many producers and consumers die without being eaten. Decomposers convert dead material to detritus, which is eaten by detritivores. Detritivores, okay, right? So there we go. Um, decomposition also releases matter in the form of nutrients that can be used by primary producers. Without decomposers, nutrients would remain locked within dead organisms. So I think we have some good information there. Um, that we can go up and fill in the next couple boxes here, okay? <clears throat> so what do we have? We have a text box. I'm going to put this up here. So food webs are more complicated food webs are more complicated than a web because, ah, boom, because many animals eat <laughs> more than one kind of food. Okay. A network. Uh, it's also, we could also think of it as a network of feeding interactions. I kind of like that. I like that, that, that term, feeding interaction. I'm going to use that more often now. Um, you know, especially when, like, when I'm cooking food or meeting food, I'm like, yep, I'm having my feeding interaction now. Ha, funny. So, um, details, evidence, oh, let's X this out, that's where that is. Okay, so here we go. So, a food web is a uh, network that includes, dang, boxes are small, includes, All the food chains, chins, <laughs> chains in an ecosystem. Okay. Um, and I think this is important too. Without, without decomposers. 
the composers. Doesn't like that word, decomposers. That's okay. Um, nutrients, right? Would remain. Uh, there you go. Nutrients would remain locked within dead. Organisms. Organisms. Boom. Okay. So that's cool. Um, kind of like that there. I'm going to look up what a visual for food web is. Food web. Right? Let's see what some images look like. Ooh. Food web. So we got some interesting information here. We got it's called trophic level levels. We got first primary. Secondary, third, fourth. Okay, so we got plants down here, some insects, some squirrels, blah, blah, blah. Autotrophs, herbivores, primary carnivores, secondary, blah. Oh, look at all that stuff. Oh my God, look at this one. This one's even cooler. I got bacteria. Oh man, look at all. It goes all over the place. So, kind of all goes. This is a desert biome uh, food web, the soil food web. I don't know if you guys, how much you guys can see this, but this is great. All right, so that's kind of what we can look up when we see some some food webs. I think that's good, good enough. Okay, food webs and disturbance. What happens if the food webs are disturbed? Okay, we have to skip over that little chart there. Changes to food web can cause a variety of effects. These effects are hard to predict because food webs are complex. All right, so that's interesting. We should probably do something. That okay. Sometimes the effects of changes are minor. Some animals can adjust well to changes in food webs. For example, if they eat a variety of foods, good. That's good to know as well. Okay, so it's good to eat a bunch of different foods. Other times, a change can have dramatic effects throughout a food web. Okay. So, um, let's go back over here. Let's fill this part out again. Got some information changes to a food web can cause a variety of effects. Okay, right? Obviously, you know, changes in food, plants, animals. Um, for other plants and animals will have do some issues. Okay. And some some are minor. Okay, some animals can adjust, but sometimes the Changes have uh, dramatic effects. Okay, um, I'm gonna write especially if uh, animals only eat one type of food. Now, I'm actually kind of thinking of a specific animal right now, the koala bear. Koala bears primarily, and I think only, eat uh, eucalyptus trees. So that would be, that's an issue when those trees are no longer there for them to eat. Okay. Well, that. The koala bear is going to starve. Okay. Wait, is that true, though? Let's see. Okay, Google. What? Nope. That was a fail. What do koala bears eat? Eucalyptus leaves, right? Koalas eat mainly eucalyptus leaves, occasionally eat leaves from other native Australian trees, and they also use blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so they primarily eat um, eucalyptus leaves. Hmm. Interesting. So once again, if that's that's it might be a problem. All right, let's go to some pyramids now. Okay, pyramids. How do ecological pyramids? Oh no, did we answer? I don't think we answered. Oh, there was a question up here. Hold on. Let's before we get to that. One. Draw a model of a spider web, then describe how a spider web is similar to a food web. Okay. Go back to my other page here. So a spider web is sim hmm, similar to a food web. Because it's multiple chains linked together ah. together oh oh maybe I meant to say because it has as multiple chains linked together and the spider similar to other similar to other Consumers gets food in a variety of a variety of ways, right? Because the spider can crawl all over the place. All right, not just one path. Okay, you guys can see that. Um, just adjust a little bit. It's not bad. That's not bad. I think I like that. That's not bad right there. Okay, cool. All right, so spider web is similar to a food web because it has multiple chains linked together. And the spider, similar to other consumers, gets food in a variety of ways, not just one path. It's pretty nice. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. All right, let's look at some ecological pyramids. Each step in a food chain or food web is called a trophic level. Um, primary producers make up the um, first trophic level. Consumers occupy the other levels. Ecological pyramids are models of trophic levels in a food chain or food web. The shape of the pyramid shows a relative amount of energy or matter in each level. Okay. Only a small amount of energy in any trophic level is available to organisms at the next trophic level. This is because organisms use much of the energy they consume on processes to stay alive. Energy is also released as heat. Pyramids of energy show the relative amount of energy available at each trophic level of a food chain or food web. The pyramid is widest at the bottom. The shape of the pyramid shows the efficiency of energy transfer between levels. An average about 10%, I think that's important, uh, an average about 10% of the energy in one trophic level is transferred up to the next trophic level. Okay. Um, okay, good to know. Um, okay, so that's pyramids of energy. Let's go back up here, see what we can do. Put some stuff in here. They already filled this, this the other part out for us. An average of about 10% of the energy is transferred okay, between the levels. All right. Uh, organisms, organisms use much of the energy they consume on processes to stay alive. Okay, I think that's important too. So let's go back down here and let's go. Uh, 
Um, okay, pyramids of biomass and pyramids of numbers. The amount of living tissue is a troph in a trophic level is called its biomass. The amount of biomass in a trophic level is determined. You do trash. Okay, bye bye. Okay. Um, so pyramids of biomass, okay, um, and pyramids of numbers. The amount of living tissue in a trophic level is called as biomass. I like that word. So I'm actually gonna. Oh, oh can't highlight it yet because I didn't. Boom. Good. Uh, amount of biomass in a trophic level is determined by the amount of energy in that level. Okay. A pyramid of biomass is a model that shows the relative amount of living organic matter in each trophic level of an ecosystem. Amount of living matter in each trophic level of an ecosystem. Okay. Pyramid of numbers is a model that shows a relative number of individual organisms at each trophic level in an ecosystem. The pyramid of numbers for an ecosystem is usually similar in shape to the pyramid of biomass. The number of organisms on each level decreases from the level below it. Sometimes consumers are much smaller than the organisms they feed upon. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, right here, actually. You can see this. This one tree is feeding all these beetles. All right. Here you can see that in the world, there's a lot more trees and they weigh a lot. So, you know, in the world, obviously, you can you could tell that there's a lot more trees. Um, even though people like tell us like, oh, my God, there's not enough trees. There's definitely a lot of trees in the world. Do we need more trees? Absolutely. But there are still a lot and they weigh a lot. Ever try to pick up a tree? Don't do it. You're going to hurt yourself. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this here's my example. For example, thousands of insects may eat from a single tree. In such cases, the pyramid of numbers may be upside down, um, but the pyramid of biomass will still be smaller at the top than at the bottom. Okay. The, so this, this is obvious, you know, all these obvious answers or things here. Okay. Um, so we're just going to go through, I'm going to go through and answer some of this stuff here um, before I continue on too far. Um, where's my chart? Okay. So here we go. Text box. Um, pyramids of biomass. Okay. <clears throat> organisms. Organisms use much of the energy they ooh, they consume. On Oh, no, that's from before. <laughs> I already did this one. Let's get rid of this information then because I already put that up in periods of pyramids of energy. That's fine. Biomass. Okay, in a trophic level is determined. Determined by the amount of energy energy in that level boom okay and i kind of did this one sh short because um i think other stuff is a little bit more important than this chart especially at the bottom here or numbers of organisms um, decrease as the level goes up. Trophic doesn't like trophic either. And whatever. All right, cool. Uh, so, so eh, we could leave that there for now. I think we might come back to it. Maybe not. I don't know, I'm not sure. Here, did that one. Okay, so find a chain that connects algae to the oil alligator. Honestly, I don't know what this is asking me to do, so I'm really not going to do this part. You guys are free to do that. Um, um, but, you know, obviously food chains can connect algae to alligators. I'm not saying they can't. 
Then it says find another food chain from the salt meadow, salt meadow grassy alligator. Use two pencils of different color to highlight the two food chains. Now, obviously, I would do this differently. Everybody's going to do this differently here. You can do the algae, maybe to the shrimp, to the muskrat, um, to the bobcat, to the alligator, or the algae to the shrimp, to the pelican, to the alligator, or the algae to the shrimp, to the catfish, uh, to the alligator, right? You know, you probably do some stuff like that. Sure, why not? Do it. Okay, so we're going to go from the algae, right, to the shrimp, right? to the catfish to the alligator right or alternatively we could go from the algae to the shrimp right to the uh, killifish to the pelican right and then i'm sure alligators have eaten pelicans before so you know, to the alligator. You could do something like that. That's that's fine. Number two, though, it says how are primary producers important to the alligator's energy supply? Well, that's obvious. Okay. Um, without primary producers, um, such as shrimp, right fish birds and other no okay um oh and other consumers and other consumers would not be able to eat and thus second time I'm using thus and thus the alligator would not be able to eat eat them right so if the shrimp and the fish and the birds can't produce, can't feed on the primary producers, then the alligators can't feed on those bigger things. Okay, so I'm through that. Um, how could decomposers be added to the diagram? Now, this is an interesting question, and here's how I answered this. I went back to decomposers and I looked and I said, okay, well, how can that, how can, um, where are they? Decomposers, right? Decomposers, no, are they here? No, they're not here. They're not there. Where are the decomposers? Um, there we go. So, so these decomposers, remember, they the nutrients remain locked within the dead animal, the dead organisms, and so without the decomposers, nutrients would be locked in there. So, in my opinion, right, okay, decomposers, decomposers can be added anywhere in the diagram since they convert dead material detritus right and lease matter in the form of nutrients ah boom literally any right so any of the organisms uh, can die which is why i'm saying that decomposers can be added anywhere in this diagram they can go anywhere in here 
because any of these organisms can die and the decomposers can then come in and take that um, that material and and release nutrients okay so and they affect which parts of the food web do they affect right they affect all parts that's how i'm answering that um hopefully i'm right all right let's keep moving on and rocking and rolling okay around page 46 right now let's keep going to 47 we took some notes in here already because we had some pyramids and stuff we already went over that so here we have up here it says write the name of the pyramid on the line above each pyramid then below explain the relationships among trophic levels that are shown by the pyramids okay so we have a pyramid of energy right here okay then we have a pyramid of biomass pyramid of biomass and then we have a pyramid of numbers okay right, pyramid of numbers so let's do this right oh my gosh this is gonna be along the pyramid okay of energy shows that only a small amount of energy, about 10%, right, is available to the next level, right? Okay. Oh, nope. you know what? I'm gonna make another one here. Okay. Um, the pyramid of biomass shows that there are. Uh, lot of trees and they <laughs> weigh a lot okay so you can see it from this pyramid of biomass obviously the trees they weigh a lot this is huge right biomass has to be bigger at the bottom um, so i think that's good for that and basically uh the Pyramid of numbers shows that many insects can feed on one tree. Okay, and that's you know it shows some other stuff here too, but many insects are feeding on this one tree, so it's kind of why it looks like this. Okay, all right. Here we go, cycles of matter. Okay, so we have some different cycles now. This is chapter three, chapter four, lesson three, cycles of matter, All right? Um, a lot of stuff going on here. I actually had to look some of this stuff up too. So we had the, um, wait, did I answer all these questions? No. Oh, um, we can say auto trophy and Heterotroph, right? Heterotroph. Okay. Oh, uh, man, I didn't answer. <laughs> what other answers did I not give here? Um, look at this one, too. Look at the food web above. Suppose that the population of pelicans decline. Bobca bobcats may adjust and eat more what? What might bobcats eat more? Uh, probably raccoons and muskrats, right? Okay, if the pelicans decreased, so they probably will eat more raccoons. Yes, 
Raccoons does have two C's and two O's. And Musk Rats. Okay. It's pretty easy. You can just look right at the thing. Right at the answer there. Okay. Chapter 4, Lesson 3. Cycles of Matter. Am I still recording here? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Okay. Cycles of Matter. Um, boy. You know, I came through and looked at this Cycles of Matter, and I kind of found out that humans aren't doing a really good job here. Um, cycles of Matter. Here we go. Water cycle. Actually, recycling nature. So how does matter flow between trophic levels among ecosystems? All organisms contain the compounds water, carbohydrates, lipid, nucleic acids, and proteins. These compounds are mainly made of the elements oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Organisms cannot make these elements. These elements, like other, like all matter, can never be created or destroyed. Matter flows from one trophic level to another. Matter also moves by being recycled with and among ecosystems. Okay, that's pretty important. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, these cycles of elements and compounds are called bio, bio, bio geochemical cycles. Um, okay, they occur, these cycles occur like in the biosphere, done by organisms, geological, Processes occur in geosphere and include volcanoes, earthquakes, and formation of rock. Chemical processes mostly occur in the hydrosphere or atmosphere and include the formation of precipitation, the flowing of water, and lightning. Human activities that affect cycles of matter on a global scale include the burning of fossil fuels and forests. And that's, we have some issues with that. Water cycles, um, the water cycle. Water cycles among the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere, sometimes outside the biosphere and sometimes in it. Water enters the atmosphere as water vapor when it evaporates from bodies of water. Water evaporates from leaves through transpiration. So water vapor condenses into droplets that form clouds. Droplets fall as rain, snow, and about um, snow, sleet, or hail. Precipitation goes into runoff. Runoff enters streams and rivers and flows into oceans or lakes. Water enters the soil as groundwater and then enters plants through the roots. Okay, so this this is a pretty important paragraph right here. This is how the water cycle works. I'm going to go back up here, actually. I'm going to put some information into how the water cycle works. Okay. Okay, so water vapor to droplets to clouds. Eh, whatever. Uh, and then rain... You get rain, snow, sleet, or hail, and then uh, which goes to runoff. Runoff is pretty important uh, to streams, rivers, to oceans. Ah! to oceans okay. lakes to soil um, as groundwater to plants to evaporation and transpiration. Okay, so that's the water cycle, basically. Okay, you can maybe move this around a little bit. We can kind of get it a little bit more prettier than it is, but that's it's pretty good for now. Okay, carbon cycle. Um, carbon cycle. Blah, blah. Nutrients are elements that are need to sustain life, obviously, like water nutrients pass through their organisms in the environment through biogeochemical cycles, like cycles that carry carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus through the biosphere, vital for life. Oxygen par participates in the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus cycles by combining with these elements. Photosynthesis releases oxygen gas. Oxygen is also used in cellular respiration. The carbon cycle. 
carbon is a major component of organic compounds, including carbohydrates, lipids. All right, so all this is important. Proteins and nucleic acids, fossil fuels are made of carbon, animal skeletons. Uh, I don't know about that. I'm just going to keep that right there. Okay. So photosynthesis removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Respiration returns carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Okay. Producers use carbon dioxide to make organic compounds that are consumed by heterotrophs. Decomposers break down organic compounds, releasing carbon and other nutrients in the environment. Not all carbon is released by decomposition. Remains of primary producers buried millions of years ago were transformed into fossil fuels. Okay. All right. Carbon cycle. Text box. Okay. Carbon cycle. So basically, there's more to it than this, but this is my notes. Photosynthesis removes carbon. Respiration, which is breathing, returns carbon. Okay. Um, I found I find this pretty you know pretty important too. Carbon is in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. Lipids. proteins and nucleic acids nucleic acids right um, and also this is kind of important too we release A lot of ener uh, or a lot of carbon by human activity. Okay, and the nitrogen cycle. <laughs> Organisms. Oh, I haven't read that yet part yet. So let's go back to the nitrogen cycle. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So then we continue on. We went from the water cycle. Now we're going to the carbon cycle. We already did that. And we're going to the nitrogen, cy nitrogen cycle. All organisms require nitrogen to make amino acids and nucleic acids. See, there's a lot of important stuff in all these cycles here. Okay. Most nitrogen is in the form of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. Nitrogen containing compounds such as ammonia and nitrite, nitrate are in the biosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere. Nitrogen gas is abundant, but most organisms can't use it. I found that fascinating too. Only certain types of bacteria can convert nitrogen gas into ammonia through a process called nitrogen fixation. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Nitrogen fixing bacteria live in soil and so on. In soil and on the roots of certain plants, other bacteria convert ammonia into nitrite and nitrate, which can be used by primary producers. When consumers eat producers, these nitrogen compounds are reused. Decomposers um, release nitrogen compounds from animal waste and dead organisms. Some bacteria obtain energy by converting nitrites into nitrogen gas, which is released into the atmosphere in a process called denitrate. Vacation. Okay. And then we talk about um, yeah. human activities and all that stuff. Uh, let's go back up and look at those notes again. Okay. So we got a, some information about the nitrogen cycle. I took some notes on. So organisms, organisms require okay, nitrogen. Uh, to make to make amino acids right and then also nitrogen uh oh mm -hmm. 
nitrogen <coughs> is abundant, uh, but we by ourselves can't really break it down. Okay, we can't use it in its form. In its form in the uh, atmosphere. Okay, so we require other, you know, other organisms, organisms to break it down for us. Okay, what have we learned so far about humans? What are we doing with all these three cycles, right? Humans are messing it up. So human activity kind of messes up some of these cycles. Um, and literally all three okay, of them, um, humans can affect in some way, shape, or form. So you can continue reading and taking notes um, on those parts. That, okay. I didn't like this question here. So it says on this page, right? How did the heading show changes in the topic of the text? And my answer to this is what and why would you ask me this? That's my answer. Or actually, I put that. But literally, that is actually my answer for that. Okay. So I'm done with that. Um, my wife's looking at me like, what are you crazy? I didn't like that question. So that's what I'm going to, that's how I'm going to answer it. Okay. What is an example? Where do I go? What is an example of a nutrient discussed in this lesson? So we bought a diff bunch of different nutrients, right? Um, in this lesson. Okay. Carbon, nitrogen, blah, blah, blah. All right. And how it helps the nourish an organism. So, there we go. So, carbon and nitrogen are discussed okay, in this lesson. Okay, and um, carbon helps make carbohydrates lipids and proteins okay all right here we go oh this is gonna be great it's the carbon cycle i actually had to look this up too because um I just, it just was kind of, you know, complex. And I thought that um, I should look at what the carbon cycle kind of looks like. And I did, you know, I, we have it here, but it's really not um, enough. So I did look it up. Okay. And I looked at some, um, you know, some answers for carbon cycle. Okay. Here is some information for how does the carbon cycle work. Right. According to Varsity Google Tutors, is going to tell us a whole the bunch carbon of stuff. cycle involves transfer of carbon from organic sources to the soil as fossil fuels and plant nutrients to the air via plant absorption and fossil fuel burning and back to organic sources as plants consume carbon dioxide in photosynthesis and animals consume plants. Okay. Fantastic. So let's look at some images. Carbon cycle. Oh, these images are bad. These are not the good images I had. Let yes. Um, and let's look at this one. Fine. Carbon cycle. Carbon dioxide. Blah blah. Cellular respiration. Photosynthesis. Kind of goes back and forth. Food. Death and decomposition. Fossil fuels. So I kind of wanted to look at a little bit of a, a diagram there, and you guys are free to do that too. Um, but describe one path. That a carbon atom, oh, there's my text box. Okay. So 
This is my answer. May or may not make sense. Organisms in marine. Okay, because it does talk about carbon in the marine sediments, right? Um, we go down into fossil fuels. Then humans dig that up and burn it. Which then goes into the atmosphere. Okay. So that's one. There's a lot of different paths. If you look here on this diagram, the carbon atom could go, could follow. You guys are free to kind of do a different one, right? How does the diagram show the effects of photosynthesis and cellular respiration? So while we know this, right? While cellular respiration <clears throat> releases carbon dioxide carbon dioxide into the <clears throat> environment. Um, photosynthesis this pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere right okay cool cool so they kind of work in a little cycle there even of themselves, but there's other stuff that happens uh, during those times. Okay. So we have some other stuff going on. We'll go into the nitrogen cycle. Um, I found this is an interesting question right here. Which type of living things perform um, nitrogen fixation? And it literally has it like right above here. Nitrogen fix. Oh, fail. Ah, no. Okay. Nitrogen fixation, process of converting nitrogen gas into nitrogen compounds that plants can absorb and use. It literally says plants. Uh, I want to highlight it again. No. Oh, my God. It's going to highlight the whole thing. No. Okay. So plants. Okay. And I'm like, what? Which type of living things perform nitrogen fixation? Plants. Right? It literally says plants. Right there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so plants, obviously, you know, nit nit nutrient limitation. Got a bunch of information there. Um, at the end, if ample sunlight and water are available, the primary productivity of the ecosystem may be limited by the availability of nutrients. Any nutrient whose supply limits productivity is called a limiting nutrient. Obviously, if there's limited nutrients, guys, things aren't going to grow or, or eat or whatever. Um, it's going to be very limited. Nutrient limitation is why farmers use fertilizers. Most fertilizers contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Micronutrients such as calcium, magnesium, sulfur, iron, and manganese are sometimes included in small amounts. Nitrogen is often the limiting nutrient in the ocean. In freshwater, phosphorus is often the limiting nutrient. Runoff from rain may contain fertilizer from farms. That's true. Okay. We're like, we're putting way too much. Um, fertilizer onto our soil and into our uh, atmosphere, um, water, wow. stuff like this. Okay, so this delivers a large amount of limiting nutrients in the body's water. This stimulates producers such as algae to grow more than normal, causing what is called an al algal bloom. Several algal blooms can disrupt the functioning of ecosystems. Right, okay. So, yeah, 
And here we made it. We finally made it to our chapter four review. Okay. Um, so let's review some <laughs> vocabulary. Thought this was interesting because watch what happens when we do this. Um, we'll do eh, let's do red, I guess. Okay. So a. Sorry. The conversion of nitrogen gas to ammonia is called nitrogen fixation. We can figure that out. Let's circle that. Okay. Number two, which rely on other organisms for their energy and food supply. Okay. So primary producers, obviously not. Biomass, uh, no, because biomass is a different concept. Autotrophs are also primary producers, so A and C are the same thing, just different words. So the only one that um, relies on other organisms for their energy and food supply are consumers. Okay, number three, four, five, six, match a vocabulary term to its definition. The total amount of living tissue. Like I said, I thought this was interesting because, yeah, total amount of living tissue is biomass. Okay, small pieces of dead or decaying plant or animal remains. Okay, is detritus, right? A model of feeding levels in a food chain or food web is energy pyramid. And changing nitrogen compounds to nitrogen gas is denitrification. Okay, there you go. That's how that is. Um, review question, review key questions, provide evidence and details, support your answers. How does energy flow through ecosystems? So we were reading about this before and remember that energy flows through ecosystems. in only one direction, okay? Energy is passed from organisms at one trophic level or energy Level to organisms in the next trophic level. Trophic level. Okay. And number eight and number nine describe two ways that primary producers produce high energy compounds. Primary. Oh. All right. Sorry, my son was just, you know, trying to trip himself. Primary. Produce, pro, when I say primary production from biomass through photosynthesis. Yeah, cool. And then energy from the sun and produce it into energy, sugar, and oxygen. Okay. 
And then last one. So the how does nutrient availability relate to productivity and species survival? So the primary productivity of an ecosystem may be limited by the availability of nutrients okay every organism needs nutrients nutrients to build tissues and carry out life functions. Funk functions. Okay. So, wow, we made it through the end. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty good. You know, I think that maybe Miss Paulini want, might want some more stuff added to this. I highly suggest, you know, you watch this all the way through and go through my thinking um you know that's uh it's a lot of stuff here and i look forward to um all of you guys completing this as well as you know um your biome projects things like that hope you guys are well um, have a great day and have a great week. Thank you very much.